Representative of the state government, and uh, thank you too to the, uh, the guests who are still here to, to listen to me so close to, to beer o'clock. All right, well, uh, I'm here literally, it a, really is literally a, I love a sales pitch, but why should that be unusual given the, the nature of the conference? I'm not actually selling anything though, because what I'm about to speak about we'll be giving away in about a month's time. So, uh, so stand by, and uh, I'll give you a very brief tour of the, some of the product that's about to come out of this accelerated geoscience program. So I'm also fortunate in that our minister spoke this morning and pretty much laid the groundwork that uh, provides the background behind why the Geological Survey is doing what it's doing in this accelerated geoscience program. So the, the government uh, is aspiring to make Western Australia a prosperous and resilient low carbon economy with net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. So they're not waiting for the federal government to move on that. Um, and critical, uh, and particularly battery minerals, are going to be an important aspect of this. And uh, those three of the key policy <coughs> documents that listed there, so the future battery industry strategy, the uh, energy transformation strategy, and the, uh, the climate strategy that uh, have all come out in the last two years. So the accelerated geoscience program is what the geological survey has been up to in the past year to uh, rapidly accelerate the delivery of product, of geoscience information, that is directly relevant to, uh, to the minerals industry and the uh, energy industry in general. So we all know this, Western Australia is well endowed in minerals. This is just a, a, a periodic table which shows what we're currently mining, what we could potentially be mining. We know it's either present uh, as byproduct in existing deposits or might be out there because we have the right sorts of rocks. And uh, the critical minerals are highlighted in red there and a goodly proportion of those are the so-called battery minerals. Okay, so the Accelerated Geoscience program involved five themes. I'm speaking specifically about the critical minerals theme, uh, which is the, uh, the one I was leading up. There were four other themes, one looking at statewide geoscience, looking at other statewide data sets that uh, complement the data that uh, my team has brought out. Uh, the new en the energy um, theme, looking at uh, mainly the uh, petroleum uh, and gas side, but also looking at hydrogen and uh, some of the aspects there. And then there were two regional groups looking uh, most particularly at the southwest terrain of Western Australia and the Far East Yulgarn uh, part of Western Australia and collecting, uh, we're all collecting essentially complementary data sets. So there's no repetition, we all collaborated happily together. So in my group, we had to decide, well, what should we focus on in critical minerals? And what you can see here is that although According to uh, the federal government in Australia, there are something like uh, 24 critical minerals identified uh, and in a range of geological environments. Uh, we, in order to get some stuff out in a year, limited our focus to just uh, this list here. So uh, specifically, uh, you know, bismuth, germanium, etc. the battery minerals that are traditionally regarded as such, uh, highlighted in red there and limited our consideration to just a few geological environments in which uh, we either know they are or there's pro some prospect that they're there. Now we largely used our own uh, data, but in some cases we trawled and found some, uh, some public domain third party data that we could also add to this collection of, uh, of information that we're packaging up to deliver to, to the industry, which will hopefully uh, encourage them to, uh, to uh, invest in Western Australia and make the discoveries of, uh, of new battery mineral resources that are going to be required because, as we've all heard through the day, demand can only go up and uh, the existing resources are not going to, uh, not going to last forever. So it, it, the uh, product is also demonstrating the availability, uh, the, the types of data that we have and the methodology that we have used to actually trawl into that data. So for the purposes of our product, we looked at just a particular series, a particular collection of classes and, and sources of map data. So that are relevant to, to these battery and critical minerals. So we looked at known occurrences. Uh, we looked at the prospective rock types for these sorts of minerals. Uh, mineral fertility indicators that might either indicate that a particular prospective rock is present or that uh, there is the mineralization or associated alteration that's present. Uh, we also looked at geochemistry and there are a couple of other data sets. Now uh, the databases or data sets that we used are there on the right. Now the one highlighted in red, WAMEX, in big, big red letters there, 
is significant because this is the exploration geochemistry database which has been sitting in, uh, in our statutory reporting collection for 20, 30, 40 years and industry has been very keen to try and get this out as a single large data set. And I'm happy to report that we've, we've actually made a first pass at this and you'll see at least a couple of examples of how we've, uh, we've done that and used the, uh, used the product. So if I go quickly and just present you with a series of maps just to illustrate the sorts of product that we are, we're producing, uh, there's, here's our standard Mindex uh, layer that you find in GeoView. Lots of pretty colours, but you can't really tell much other than there's clustering of particular types of commodities in the state. Wouldn't it be great if you could actually just focus in on, uh, on a particular commodity that you're interested in and work out where it is in the state? Well, you can uh, if you know how to search through the Mindex database. And so we have. Uh, we've selected a series of, uh, of critical slash battery minerals. There's, uh, I think, 16 here in this list. And uh, stripped out all the mineralisation occurrences for those particular commodities. Now, those of you who know Mindex in any sort of detail will know there's a lot of other stuff in it, like infrastructure and tailings and things like that. We've stripped all that out. What you see here is just where there's known occurrences of mineralisation. And so we've done that really, and in this particular example, it's classified by the type of mineralisation site, whether it's a mine actually producing, whether it's a deposit, uh, it has a defined resource, whether it's uh, an occurrence, known, a known reasonable amount of mineralisation, or whether it's a prospect. So mineralisation is known, but nobody really knows much about it. And we also have unclassified, where we know it's likely to be present there, because it has been reported, but we don't know really anything more about it. There are other ways you can classify this data by uh, target commodity group or commodity group and we've done that for a couple of commodities because this is a, uh, a sort of a very crude proxy for the mineralisation type in which these deposits occur. So if you know how they're grouped in commodity associations that can tell you a little bit about uh, what likely type of deposit that is and so you get some feel for the spatial distribution of those. Prospective rocks, again here's our what we call our IBG, our interpreted bedrock geology map. Uh, this one in particular is a special product that my group has produced, which is the merged 1 to 100,000 scale and 500,000 scale versions. Um, and from that we can extract uh, particular relevant rock types or rock units. So we go from this to this when we apply our queries. And so we pull out all the rock units that might contain the rock types that are prospective for the type of mineralisation that you might be looking for. So this particular example shows uh, all the rock units that might have mafic intrusions. We've also managed to classify them according to whether they are likely to have be predominantly that type of rock or whether it might be a minor component. So it's some sort of confidence that you might find the right sorts of rock. <coughs> We've done it for pegmatites uh, similarly. We've uh, done it for greenstone belts again because that has relevance for exploration for pegmatites and sedimentary basins and iron formations for manganese and a number of other layers as well. WAROX is another big database that we have. It's our in-house geological observation database where uh, we've digitally recorded all the observations that geologists have made in, uh, in the geological survey over the 130 year history. And uh, it's a valuable treasure trove of interesting geological and hopefully informative geological information if only you can actually search it. Now until recently we hadn't even released this to the public as a take it as, as it is database but we've also now investigated it ourselves and worked out ways of querying it to extract particular relevant geological information. So you can get rock types out of that, where particular rock types have been observed, and again, this is for mafic intrusions. You can see anorthosites, norites and gabbros, they're particular rock types you might find in mafic intrusions that are prospective for vanadium or nickel or cobalt. We've also done the same for pegmatites. I don't have any of these layers there, but you can see where pegmatite, all the sites where pegmatites have been observed in Western Australia all the sites where uh, carbonatites, kimberlites, lamproites have been observed, and then where classic and sedimentary, uh, chemical sedimentary rocks may have been preserved, being prospective for manganese mineralisation or perhaps uh, having some uh, importance for, uh, for the right sorts of environments for other types of mineralisation deposit types. So this is the first time that we ourselves have used WAROX to extract targeted information that relevant to a particular theme. And then there's third party actual fact mapping and our own actual fact mapping. If you'd asked me a year ago whether I could provide you with a map showing where all the pegmatites were in Western Australia, I would have had to have said no. And now we can. So I, we've gone into our own geological mapping and digitised all the occurrences of pegmatites across the state. 
Uh, we've also trawled all the public releases of uh, lithium exploration companies in Western Australia, borrowed their maps, geo-registered them and digitised them. So we have a series of maps showing where all the documented occurrences of pegmatites are across Western Australia. And uh, what you can see here is that uh, this just shows uh, our interpretation of uh, green bushes versus uh, the uh, Callison version of the, uh, the actual pegmatite outcrop. And similarly up here for Pilbara Minerals, uh, Pilbangura. So although on the large scale map it just looks like uh, just pink splotches, if you zoom in, you have the detail at whatever best detail there is for, uh, for that mapping. Done the same for quartz veins, if you're interested in high purity silica for various electronic applications and other things. And again, for carbonatites, kimberlites, lamprites, although I, we've borrowed those layers from our diamond exploration database, which we produced earlier on. Mineral fertility, you can again interrogate war rocks for a range of different minerals that might be indicative of the right sorts of rocks you're looking for or ore minerals, the actual mineralisation you're after, or alteration that might be in the rocks uh, that might be indicative of the, uh, the sorts of environments that you might find these minerals. So this is um, basically looking for lithium minerals and tantalum minerals, um, just three layers there. Here's anthophyllite and cordierite records, recorded sites throughout WA, and anthophyllite cordierite rocks are commonly uh, associated with metamorphosed alteration around BMS systems. So we're also looking for particular metamorphic rocks as well. So watch out for those. Geochemistry, and here's the big one. This is our data, our, our, what we call our WACM database. You can see reasonable amount of coverage uh, and nearly 50,000 sites. Uh, lots of chemistry, it's, it's um, rock, it's, uh, it's some soils, it's also some laterite samples. But uh, we have acquired other data now. So we've trawled, we've brought in the OSCHEM database from Geoscience Australia and the latter, what we call the laterite database from the CRC LEAM. They've added another few samples, but we've also got into WAMEX and we now have access to uh, chemical data for close to 9 million sample sites for surface near, what we're calling near surface geochemistry. We've also burrowed into the drilling geochemistry database and uh, in the first pass we've just gone for maximum grade in drill hole, projected back to surface and called that a surface sample. It is what it is. We've harmonised the data in as much as all the, there's just one column for every single element now, uh, but we can't guarantee the actual quality of the, the data inside it. Okay, so uh, we use this and these are some of the products. So here's one for, uh, for manganese, we, for rock chips out of the WAMEX database. Here's an, the table just provides a, a list of other sorts of chemical analyses that we've, we've pulled out and produced maps for. So you can start actually seeing patterns of, of uh, high concentrations of particular elements at the state scale now. Okay, you can also do other clever things like calculate alteration indices and so on. So that might indicate that you're in the right, you look, you've got the right sorts of uh, prospective rocks that you might find your mineralisation in. So here's just four alteration indices that uh, we've managed to, uh, to generate from using this large geochemical database that we will soon be providing to you all. And we've had a go at uh, water chemistry as well. So uh, thanks to CSIRO, we've stolen their, uh, their water chemistry database, or three separate databases in fact, merged them, and, uh, and we're reissuing them with, particularly with our critical minerals theme. Uh, crit critical minerals theme. So it's water chemistry from wells and bores, more than 95 analytes, uh, and we've selected, uh, say, 30 of those. This is for potassium, uh, and so you can now start plotting uh, water chemistry, and that can be useful for targeting bedrock or brine-related mineralisation. And for those of you who are into potash, uh, with the brine-related mineralisation, we've also borrowed some, uh, some data sets from Geoscience Australia, from the Bureau of Meteorology, and from our own water departments to help you with that. So, and this is the map for lakes. Uh, we've also provided uh, rainfall evaporation and evapotranspiration. Thing, layers that might allow you to then go and do your own prospectivity studies for these sorts of things. So, okay, here's the Mineral Systems Atlas. This is to remind me that, yes, we're about to bring out this big product. Uh, my theme has produced just over 250 new data layers for people. The other four themes have uh, added any number of hundred yet, I haven't counted them myself, so I can't tell you, but uh, there will be a lot. Uh, it's all due out by the end of this month, but having said that, some product is already out. So some of the uh, critical mineral material for pegmatites and for vanadium are already published in the Mineral Systems Atlas, and you can get them now.
And similarly, uh, some of the data layers from the other themes are present uh, via GeoView, via the new Energy Systems uh, Atlas that has just been invented for the purpose of this product, and, uh, and through some of our other data sets like the Data and Software Centre. Everything will go into the Data and Software Centre eventually as well, and everything will ultimately put on, be put onto online systems too. So, I urge you to go there and have a look. And uh, that's pretty much the lightning tour of, uh, of what we're about to deliver to you. <coughs> Remember, by the end of the month, uh, it'll be available in the first instance for critical minerals as a USB. Uh, we will announce when it's available. It'll, in the first instance, be available from our counter at Mineral House. And for one time only, it'll cost you nothing. <laughs> so, so you can read the conclusions yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you.